we've talked about the Simeo solutions a lot. This is something that has changed a little over a year ago. Um, and essentially, whenever there's a material change to the position, you as the employer, you are required to file an amended petition. For those of us who are very familiar, who've been in the trade for a little while, we know in the good old days, we would just align a new LCA, make sure the LCA was posted at the new job location, and we were off scot-free. Unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. So it is required if there is a movement of more than 50 miles, which is pretty much the same LCA regulations, you must, it's not negotiable, it's not debatable, you will be on the wrong side of the law if you do not file an amended petition. And I will tell you once again, this came about, of course, there has to be an event which causes this, right? Came about by a company called Simeo Solutions, which happens to be Indian, who basically did not report to INS, uh, to USCIS that they had changed their location. The candidate came to get a visa stamping at the US consulate here in India, presented entirely different paperwork, which was totally incoherent with what was submitted in the petition and what was shared by the, DO, uh, the DOJ, the USCIS with the, the, the consulate. And because of the discrepancy they picked up, the fact that in the original petition, they said he was working, I'm just making this up, I think in Fremont, California or something, he's now sitting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And they said, oh, has your company filed an amended petition? Have we got a new, new LCA? And he's like, no, I don't know anything about this. Then the USCIS gave the opportunity to the company to file an amended petition. Lo and behold, the company had shut its operations in Fremont, California, and moved down the street to wherever, you know, San Ramon, for lack of better ways to locations. And they did not report it. So there are, I'm sure, hundreds of thousands of petitions that were just like non-compliance. And then the USCIS came down with what we consider a very draconian law called the Simeo Solutions. So just so now that I've given you the history of how this occurred, essentially any material change, what do you consider as material change? Any change in job title and job duties, and now any change in job location. Anything beyond 50 miles is a change. Salary just by itself can change. It's not a material change. So the person gets a raise, don't worry about the amendment. He's in the same project, same end client, no issues. Now, I have been asked for instance where we have, you know, competing client, uh, end client, sorry, for some of our clients who are like five miles away or sometimes in the same building. So they're like, Anadisa, should we do uh, an amended petition? On the face of it, he's going to still be the systems analyst. He's still going to have the same responsibilities, but it's going to be an entirely different end client. Given the increased inspections, given the increased compliance focus of USCIS today and DOL, I will tell you, file an amended petition. Because what he's doing or she's doing is still a systems analyst with the same job duties that you put in the petition. It's risky. I mean, you could take the risk, but tomorrow if there's an ICE investigation and they show up at the other client side that you have on your LCA, which is even five miles down the road, and the candidate is not there, what happens? So essentially, based on that, I would recommend, and that's what we do with our clients, is file an amended petition. The good news is it's only the base fee. For now, it's 325. It's going to increase as we talked about in December 23rd. But it's just that fee. It's not the thousands and thousands that you for, add for Acquia and training and blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, you know, uh, your lawyer's fees. But it would be safer if you file an amended petition, even if it's five miles down the road, because it's a different client. The different client justifies why there's a different itinerary of work. Not every client has the exact same thing. It's not a cookie cutter, right? There is the nature of the business might be cookie cutter, but what exactly this consultant is doing is not. So that's you know my recommendation. Um, moving on, I just want to touch upon this. You know, um, there are issues. There's always been this peripatetic employee because a lot of IT companies have consultants moving you know, back and forth between client sites. In a situation where there is an employee who just spends, and doesn't constantly do this every week, but just spends maybe five days in one place, which is a one-off occurrence, you do not have to file a new LCA, you do not have to do an amended petition. Similarly, if there is a worker who travels occasionally on casual short-term basis, not exceeding 10 days, the same rules apply. You just pay him or her for the weekly expenses for each day when they travel, and you, they're obviously based on salary. 
um, you don't have to do a new um, LCA as such. Now, I just, wa I just wanted to add something else with the LCA location. Um, I, if it comes back to me, I'll deal with the Q&A. So that's pretty much everything that we can say that I will deal with ICE investigations in a few slides from now. But essentially, with the H's, I cannot stress enough, please be careful when you, you submit the first petition. Try your level best to, most, to insert most of what is legitimate and document your case from the very beginning. And that will pay off for you in the foreseeable future. Uh, in addition to that, um, let's move on to perm process. We are familiar, this is the first step for any EB2 or EB3 positions, which is basically employment-based second pre preference, employment-based third preference. I won't go into the categorization too much because I am presenting next, uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, a detailed presentation we have on perms. But essentially, the focus here is placing, conducting what is considered to be a test of the US labor market. You have to prove to the US Department of Labor, now this is not the USCIS, this is the USDOL, Department of Labor, entirely different division of the government where you are not displacing a US worker. How do you do that? You have to conduct what is called a good faith effort of testing the US labor market. There are different ways to do it. There are some that are listed here. You place a job order. A job order is pretty much a ad that you put for the Department of Labor of that particular state. In addition, you have to put, uh, that's valid for 30 days, two consecutive ads in the paper of most popular cir cir circulation of where the job is located. In addition to that, you have a choice of three that you have to maintain of the 10 that is listed of employments that you have to touch base, either job fairs, employer's website, job search website, which is like job uh, career builders, hot jobs, monster, stuff like that, on-campus recruitment, trade or professional organizations, private employment firms, employee referral program, campus placement offices, local and ethnic newspapers, or radio television. So with these, under number three, with these, you just choose any three. I'll tell you very typically, the employer's website is something that everybody can place the ad in. And then you can also do a job search website. Most newspapers are linked to either Monster or Career Builder. It's an online application that actually is included. It's free. And then we are looking at either an employee referral program, if your company has one, or a trade journal. I mean, very few we come across. There might be some, depending on the nature of the job, with a local and ethnic newspaper, but in IT, we seldom see that happen. Radio and television ads, campus placement, you know, I've never done one. Um, areas of perm review and modernization. Again, I just kept this to briefly to a few slides because we'll deal with it in detail tomorrow. Very clearly, the government is very aggressively going after employers to basically prove that there's labor shortages. Because then again, you know, there are, I hate to say, fraud or non-compliance to the procedure. So there, you will have to prove how you have aligned your recruitment process, how you've documented that you've conducted a review of the resumes that were sent in or submitted, how you've done that, how you've reached out to these candidates who might have, been come, who might have come close to qualifying, and then how do you document that there was, they weren't qualified. So in addition to that, uh, you do need to, essentially the whole goal of all of this is to prove that you've tried to look for a qualified US worker. Who's a US worker? It's a US citizen or a US green card holder. It's not anybody on an H1, it's not anybody on an EAD, it's not anybody student on a student visa, no. With the exception of everything else but a US citizen and a US uh, green card holder. So there could be somebody who's fully qualified you place an ad which requires supposing a master's degree in computer science, engineering, math, technology, with five years of experience in blah, 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 XML, UML, PL, SQL, you know, everything, and this person is an H-1B worker. It's pretty much chalked off to not authorized for employment. You focus on just US citizens and green card holders. They are changing, I must say, um, they are changing the way they're reviewing these petitions and with a lot of appeals and pushbacks that they're getting from employers and lawyers, essentially they are now 
reevaluating what we would consider non-material errors. Now, if for very innocently an employer or whoever submitted a perm on their behalf makes a very clerical error, which you can foresee that the person made a mistake, there is a new trend to revalue those and rather than just, uh, you know, just deny it on the face of it. And we'll get into more, all, if not most, of the cases tomorrow. So bear with me, please. Okay, the next visa category that we want to touch base on today in this session is the L1. The L1A, the L1B. We'll get into the L1B in the next slide. I want to start with the L1. Very clearly, we all know what is the L1 visa and how is it different than the H. The H we just talked about, it's a such as your occupation. The H we talked about how you need to require a bachelor's degree. We talked about how the candidate must be aligned to the education and the professional background of the position required, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. L1 visas are only for multinational corporations, are corporations who are basically have a branch, affiliate, subsidiary, parent, joint venture, whatever it may be, the categorization, in the US and vice versa in a foreign country. Let's just take India for where we are today. So a company either could have the headquarters here and a branch subsidiary affiliate in the US or vice versa. And you will need to prove that the employee that you're considering must have worked for the employer abroad, which is in this case in our hypothetical India, for a minimum period of one year. Now, there was some change in the law several years ago where they reduced it to six months. That's a thing of the past. They just tried that out for, I think, less than a year or two, and they got rid of it. So for all practical purposes, when you're considering somebody for the L visa, you have to meet these two qualifications. Now, I must tell you, please, 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 and everybody knows what I'm going to mention in the next sentence, the L1 visa is not an alternative when the H cap is reached. Oh, you, he didn't make it to the cap or she didn't make it to the cap, let's try the L. It's not something that is, you will just fit the person in because we'll go over now what the requirements are. L1As, I'm super strict about what an L1A is. It's a multinational managerial position. So it, the person you has to document to us that the person is currently in a manager, managerial position in the office in India. I need to see org charts. I need to see managerial job duties. I need to see the percentage of time that he or she has performed each of these job duties and document even with exactly the subordinates, are they professionals? Are, is this manager supervising professionals? Then do the exact same thing duplicated in the US for the offered position. Offered position, is this a managerial position? Is this a position that you can show me an org chart where there are people that are subordinates documented? What are the managerial job duties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you put a petition together as black and white as that, I've never had an L1A blanket denial and an L1A USCIS denial. But it, the threshold is very, very, very high. Because once again, you do not want to put a weak case in front of them, but they'll rip you up and you'll get a seven page RFP, which you'll again have to go back and deal with everything that I'm telling you to do from the get go. There are some who might be you know, lacking in training, but not all of them. So be careful when you prepare your petitions. So, the regular manager, which is a non-functional manager, as for those who are familiar with the L1A, you know there are two different ones. The regular manager is what I showed, which I just addressed. The functional manager is one that I will admit, even me, after 23 years, I'm a little you know, nervous, a little you know, cautious about uh, pushing through. A functional manager is a manager that manages a function. And how you build the business necessity argument is company specific. It is more vague because you don't necessarily have to have a team underneath you, but then you still, the requirements of proving that this person is functioning in a manager, the threshold is 10 times higher than just a regular manager. So it's very case specific and will have to be developed with your in-house team or your attorney. And if you're not clear of how this person justifies fitting that category, you let the USCIS officer interpret whichever way he or she you know, wants to, and that's where you're gonna get into trouble. Here are some quick you know, comparison between what we call a regular manager and a functional manager. The regular manager manages the organization or a department, subdivision, function, or component of the organization. 
Supervisors controls the work of other supervisory professionals and managerial employees. So remember, you cannot have what the typical RFE that you might get if you have subordinates who are not professionals is, oh, the manager is a first line supervisor. How do you get over that threshold? So very clearly, we will only approve a case for an L1A if you show me an org chart where not only is this candidate has a managerial title, but supervises people who are also professionals. They don't all have to be managers, but at least some of the you know, five people, seven people, 15 people, 20 people that he supervises has to be managers. And then there will be the third level underneath them. Um, has the authority to hire and fire or recommend those to other personnel actions such as promotions or leave authorizations, exercises discretion over day-to-day -day operations of the activity or function for which the employee has authority. Comparatively, the functional manager. Manages the organization or a dependent department, subdivision, functional component, that's same. Manages an essential function within the organization or a department or sub uh, subdivision of the organization. Functions as a senior level within the organizational hierarchy or with respect to the function managed. This is where you really have to, your write-up has to be perfect, your documentation has to be perfect. This is like the gray area where you are inviting, if it is weak, RFEs and denials. Exercises discretion over day-to-day -day operations of the activity or function for which the employee has authority. Now to flip to L1Bs. L1Bs, as we know it, very different to the L1As. You don't even, uh, so very different to the L1As and very different to the H1B. H1B is the person needs to document he or she has a bachelor's. Guess what, for an L1, you don't need to do that. Most of our cases have it, but you don't need to. So the person could have a high school degree and then could have you know, 25 years of experience. He's perfectly fine or she's perfectly fine being qualified for the L1B, okay? Necessary to understand the critical distinction. There has been a change in USCI's interpretation of L1B, and that is what I want to address. They have kind of opened up the interpretation, and I will tell you for those of us who were there um, last, um, Zoom conference last year, um, I did take the opportunity to speak to the team, the, the team that approved the blanket petitions in Chennai. I'm talking specifically of the L blanket petition, sorry. Oh, for those who don't know what an L blanket is, depending on the volume of visa processing you have for some you know, IT companies, obviously all the large ones, you get a special privilege of not having to submit the petition to the USCIS. You bypass the USCIS because they have already you know, audited and vetted your organization because that's a blanket application. And if once it's approved, you pretty much go directly to the consulate with the L blanket. So that's just something that's only centralized in Chennai for the last couple of years. So in that case, um, this is a USCIS directive. I want to also to take just 30 seconds to distinguish the different government players we have with what we do for a living. We've talked about the USCIS. That's under DOJ, which is Department of Justice. We have touched upon PERM, which is DOL, which is Department of Labor. And then the consular section is not the USCIS, it's the DOS, which is the Department of State. So rules that have been made in the DO DOJ for, which is compliant to what USCIS has to follow, need not be followed with the DOJ because they're an entirely different division of the government. So from that perspective, I had gone up to the gentleman and I said, oh, so are you gonna now see an increase in L1B approvals? And he said, no, we don't have to comply with what USCIS says. So that's the truth. If you submit individual petitions to the USCIS, as sometimes if you get an L1 denial in Chennai, they'll say, oh, this was a misclassification or categorization, go to the USCIS and file the petition again. So then you'll get an opportunity, or companies may want to strategize differently and send the petition instead of the blanket to the USCIS, and then if you get an approval there, you will then take that 797 approval to the Chennai and your chances are better with an L1B situation, okay? So USCIS came up with these semi-relaxed rules of interpretation of what specialized knowledge is. So we've talk I've talked to you about specialty occupations, flipped to specialized knowledge. What is specialized knowledge? Which doesn't apply to L1A. L1A I talked about, just managers. L1B, specialized knowledge, is the company, typically, if it has proprietary tools, this candidate must be trained in those proprietary tools and then should be even working in those proprietary tools and then that kind of 
is the niche visa that they've carved out for the L1B. Now, they have opened up a little bit, and let's discuss that. We need to understand the critical distinction between specialized knowledge and advanced knowledge as per this policy memorandum that came out in 2015. We need to be able to classify each individual case as one requiring specialized knowledge or advanced knowledge. Subsequently draw the appropriate comparisons required for each type as defined in the policy memo, and that's what we're gonna go into right now. Specialized knowledge, what is specialized knowledge? Knowledge of the petitioning organization's products, services, research, equipment, 